This is episode 63 of the Rise Up Podcast. We're a morning radio show hosted by Steve, Therese, and Tim on Family Life, a network of stations across New York and Pennsylvania. Our podcast is a weekly conversation that will help you think and grow in your faith. If you haven't already, subscribe today so you don't miss a single episode and find out more about our show at familylife.org. May the blessings of the Lord be with you in all that you do today. This is Rise Up on Family Life. Easter isn't just a day. There's a a week we get to celebrate. And it really does all kick off with Palm Sunday and that what we call the triumphal entry when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the city of God, and people praised him as he was walking in. But boy, I I can only imagine the things that are going on in, in Jesus' mind. The triumphal entry... It's one of those things that's in every one of the Gospels, this hmm. this event where Jesus... So that's when you know, okay, there's something really important going on here. And it's just amazing, like that example of humility that we see, I think, first of all, hmm. that Jesus is coming in as the promised king, and he's riding on a donkey. Somebody <laughs> should have known not. something was off at that point, right? They should have been like, wait yes. a second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because a donkey is a, a humble creature. And that donkey, though had to be part of that scene because it was prophecy. Do you remember where that prophecy comes from? Well, only because I did some research uh, so that I would know. Zechariah 9.9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your kings come to you, righteous and victorious, low, and Mm. riding on a donkey, on a colt, (sighs) the foal of a donkey. And what's remarkable is when Jesus says, Hey, go get this donkey. It's right yeah. where he says it's going to be, you know, and and I wonder sometimes why we get so tripped up on trusting God. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like God put a donkey in just yeah. the place that it would be so that it could fill, fulfill this prophecy from generations earlier. And we still worry. Uh, I don't know. Is God going to come yeah. through? <laughs> right. If we skip ahead to Thursday of that week. We have this Maundy Thursday. I mean, the Latin root is Madame, which means commandment or mandate. Oh. And so Maundy Thursday is the day of the commandment. This is what it's really about. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just mm. as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And wow. so that's really the heart of Jesus' message. It's the heart of our faith. God loves you so much that he sent his son to the earth to pay for your sins. It's the love that held Jesus on the cross. You know, growing up, I did not grow up in the church, and, you know, I'd heard the word and Jesus on the cross, and it really didn't mean, it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't, I didn't understand why, I didn't all, all that. So now fast forward to, I understand why he went to the cross, mm. but it still almost seems unfathomable, unreal. Certainly mm. not the way we would uh, choose to to save the world, because it all it all just seems so unfair when mm, when yeah. you look at it. And and I felt that way when I first learned about it before I was even a Christian. And now, as a believer for many years, it's like, wow, what an unfair thing mm. to happen. It is it makes me think the unfairness of it of. Jesus' words on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's what theologians call the cry of dereliction, which really is just this difficult thing to get our heads around, that there's a moment where Jesus is experiencing abandonment, forsakenness. Uh, That's one of those things where it's almost too bad to be true is how I feel about it. But at the same time, I know, no, the whole bad news of what Good Friday is, well, ultimately, that's why it's going to become good news for us. Right. The glimpse of humanness, and I think, and I even hate to go here to even try to even compare, because there's no comparison to what Jesus went through and the pain. So mm. that it's, it's a silly comparison. But I, I try to simplify things in my own life. Like, what does that mean for me? And I try to put myself, again, you can't compare it, but let's say you're in a situation I'm just saying at work, when someone next to you, and, and you've been totally on the level, you've done things the right way, you've done things perfectly, you've done things the way, and now all of a sudden, someone who has cheated, lied, done everything, and you're treated the same way 
as that liar, cheater, stealer. <sighs> yeah. And th- what would our reaction be? It's not right. there. Right. <laughs> right. And we would scream and complain and, and, and kick all the way, you know, to the boss. However, what I remember the very first time that, again, I didn't become a Christian until I was in my 30s, that, that I looked at that situation and I said, wait a minute, in that situation, he's, he was perfect. He's right next to, he's, he's being treated the same way next to a prisoner or a thief, uh, and he has compassion mm. for the person next to him. And I thought, wow, that's, that's who we're supposed to be. Mm. It's not easy, uh, but that's who we're supposed to be. And what an example in the worst of circumstances. We can't think of anything worse that would ever happen to us. And I hope nothing, you know, even mm-hmm. comes close to that. But in the worst of circumstances, the pain we can't even imagine, that was Jesus' attitude of compassion for the prisoner. And that just, that has blown me away since day one. It still does today. Absolutely. So why is the resurrection so important? And I know we're going to split hairs here and don't look at my <laughs> head when you split hairs because you, you wouldn't get very far. But without the resurrection... If you'd thought about this, maybe you're a brand new believer. Mm. Without the resurrection, Jesus is just a a great guy, a right. great teacher, right. and a wonderful uh, human being who did wonderful things. Yeah. If he just went to the tomb and stayed there, right. we wouldn't be having this Christian talk and this faith <laughs> talk, no. uh, right? Without the resurrection, uh, I mean, it could be argued that that is the beginning yes. of Christianity. Yes. Now, I get it. You can go back and say there's lots of things before that in the prophecies. But the actual beginning of Christianity and the faith is the resurrection to me. It, it, and it's funny you say that because there are people who want to claim not just that Jesus was just a nice teacher, but they'll say, well, the resurrection's a real thing. You know, it's a spiritual resurrection. The mm-hmm. ideas of Jesus live on. His teaching lives on. And actually, no, that's not going to be hope that lasts <laughs> through the world that we live in. Uh, The Apostle Paul says, I actually was thinking about this just earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile Hmm. and you are still in your sins. He's bringing up that point. You're not forgiven from your sins if he hasn't been raised and you don't have a hope of resurrection yourself if Jesus himself wasn't raised. The whole crux is that that Jesus conquered death. And if he didn't come back to life, then he couldn't do that. And so we couldn't also conquer death and have eternal life. I mean, it's kind of the the thing, the whole thing is based on, you know, and it is interesting that there are certain factions of the Christian faith that try to minimize the resurrection. But there are so many accounts where he was like, here, let me eat this to show you that I'm not just a spirit, you know, here, touch the wounds in my body. I mean, there are so many accounts within the biblical context of Easter that prove that, yes, the real physical Jesus came back to life. He was living and breathing. It's amazing that that gets discounted. And I don't I don't understand why. Jesus changes everything. And again, I'll go back to when I was a nonbeliever growing up and growing up. It's amazing what man can do uh, to things on the calendar. To me, growing up, Christmas was the biggest Hmm. event of the year as far as holidays go in the family. Why? Because, well, presents as a kid. Yeah. But when you go to the story, you know, it's like baby Jesus was born. And that was important. And it is important to the whole story. But then you get to Easter now as a believer. This is a great way to talk to your non-believer friends. Maybe you're listening to this podcast right now and you're not a believer in Jesus. And you're not listening to this by mistake. God has an appointment for you for that. But the reason we as believers get so excited about Easter and we should be, as we've already talked about, more excited about Easter than we are Christmas. Right. Because without Easter, we don't have this faith. So it's a great way to open up a conversation to, to the non-believer friend of yours or coworker or, or whomever to say, like, you know, I get more excited about Easter than I do Christmas. And mm. they might ask, well, why? Right. And, and here's you your can chance. go ahead and, yeah, it's a chance to, to tell them why. Yeah. And speaking of telling them why, you know, right after the resurrection, we began the sharing of the gospel, you know, because that was the point where people could start to say, you're not going to believe what happened. And here is the way for you to be saved, because we had all of this proof, all of this evidence. Jesus appeared to hundreds of people before he ascended into heaven. But do you know the very first people who were commissioned with sharing the gospel after the resurrection? Hmm. It was the women. 
And oh. I'll make the joke so you don't have to. If you oh, ever please. want information to get shared very quickly, you mm-hmm. just tell a group of women and we'll take care of it. Okay. <laughs> I've never noticed that. Jim, have you? <laughs> but yeah, this right, is yeah. important because <laughs> there are a lot of things in Scripture about the roles of women in the church. Right. And, mm-hmm. and that really comes down to personal conviction in your beliefs. But the idea of sharing the gospel, it's everyone's job. You know, men, women, children, if you believe in the risen Savior, if you believe in the resurrection, it's your job to go tell somebody about Jesus. Come closer to the radio so we can see you. Wow, you look great today. This is Rise Up on Family Life. Sometimes, though, when it's one of those nights, you know, house is a mess. You just need to get something on the table for the family to eat. I'll just whip up the family a good old-fashioned onion pie. Thomas Jefferson style, like one Ooh, does. Pardon me? Well, okay. Now, <laughs> that, here, sound, that here, sounds icky. I'm here's, sorry. Here's, yeah. where the, right, here's, where this, here's where this goes here. Our third president, he had tried authentic macaroni and cheese in Europe when he was visiting one time. Well, that's delicious. Yeah, mm-hmm. he wanted to bring that experience back to the U.S. of A., but we weren't ready for this kind of high culture yet, this macaroni stuff. So the presidential dinner guests that Thomas Jefferson had over, they were confused by this pie consisting of naught but cheese and soft morsels they took to be onions because if you've never had pasta before or seen it or heard of it in your entire life you might think that they're like little sauteed shallots so the macaroni noodles they didn't get it they're like what are these weird little onions you've got in here tom this is not good 1802 americans were not ready for macaroni and cheese they didn't like it but it's a comfort to know that the meal I go to when I'm, you know, cheating on dinner at home, I'm really preparing a banquet that would baffle guests of presidential honor. (laughs) As refreshing as that first sip of coffee in the morning, this is Rise Up with Steve, Therese, and Tim on Family Life. I learned something the other day. I I mean, I I had no idea about this. And uh, when I saw this, I always thought just a seal was a seal. I thought like there's one kind, you know, like uh, 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 that, that, kind, that, that kind, kind of seal. seal. Yeah. I thought like there's one kind of seal. And then I saw the story and then I looked it up and I'm like, there's like well over 30 or 40 different types of uh, uh, seals. I mean, there's all different oh, kinds. I only so thought make... it was like the seals. Like, uh, uh, and then, <laughs> then I see this one. It happened in Canada. One was on the highway. It had got, gotten out of where it normally is. And they right. had to put it back to where it was. And sure. this kind of seal, because uh-huh. there's there's things like the gray seal and the harp seal I learned. and all Are different they all kinds uh, of, uh, uh, seals? Well, I, I, well, no. And that's the key. <laughs> oh. I'm thinking. Some of them are more like, oh! I'm thinking, well, here's this one. This one they found on the highway, put back. This was a wandering Elephant seal, which I can only imagine they would know it was an elephant seal. Uh, here we go. With a. <laughs> <laughs> How many times do I have to do that till it's funny? You got the point. Okay. We're giving out smiles that you can wear all day. This is Rise Up on Family Life. I did it again over the weekend. I don't know why I keep doing this. Right. Did it again. I um I made sourdough again. Oh, cool. Yeah, you think. You think cool. I mean, I started trying to make sourdough like when everybody tried making right, sourdough the during pandemic. the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. In what, three years? I think I have made like two hugely successful loaves, and my family has had to eat so many failure loaves. <laughs> I mean, I could have built like a little cabin, you know, out of these <laughs> brick like structures. Cabin. Right. It would be delicious. Uh, but um, I, a friend of mine had some starter and it looked really good. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, I could use some new starter. So I'll take some, sure. And it started, it smelled so good. It was like so tangy. And I was like, oh, this is going to be really, really good. She even gave me her no fail recipe, which is different than the other one I had. So I was like, well, no fail. <laughs> Let's see what I can do with this, right? And so I made the recipe. And then I got to like the very end and it said to, you know, cover it in some a light dusting of flour and score the top. And I was like, I don't need to score the top, right? Oh no. No. Yeah. It's not good. It's Uh-oh. not good at all. Oh. And and I'm like, why do I do this? Like it turned out okay. It's not inedible, which I can't say for all the loaves I've made. But we skip steps. You know, do you ever do that? Like the Bible is so clear about the things we're supposed to do. And we're like, well, I'll I'll do this. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Like, I probably don't need to do that. Like, God's good with me not doing that. And you know what that is? It's pride. Mm -hmm. I just made a big old brick-like loaf of pride. (laughs) I was still working on it. 
You guys want some bread? Uh, <laughs> is it the <laughs> really successful loaf or the kind of fail <laughs> no. loaf? Thanks for letting us be part of your morning. It's Rise Up with Steve, Therese, and Tim on Family Life. You know, you may be more literary than you think. I know I am. I just found out. So, kids, I know a lot of you are on spring break, but mm. you're more literary than you might think. And you can tell your teachers when you get back to school next week. Because, <laughs> like, like, here's the thing. Have, have you ever been, like, on a wild goose chase? You're looking for something. You finally, you know, like, forever right. in a day. Right. And you give up, and you're like... Okay, good riddance to that. I'm not even looking for it anymore. And and then you go to break the ice with somebody, and they say something. It's like, oh, that's Greek to me, and all that. Everything <laughs> I've said in those phrases, <laughs> wild goose chase, uh-huh. good riddance, Greek to me, break the ice, they're all from Shakespeare plays. That's where they Look began. At that. They doth are? They hey, doth hey, are. And here's my so favorite. Doth. Here's why I know I'm more literary <laughs> than the average person. Yes. Oh. How doth you? Oh. <laughs> I want to hear how you doth. Here's the origin in Shakespeare of the knock-knock jokes. What? It was from Look Macbeth. It was from Macbeth. Et tu, Steve A. Oh, knock-knock. <laughs> Uh, oh, who, who, who are there? <laughs> Mike, Micheth, who? Mike, kingdom for a horse. Mike, that's kingdom that's for. Still... That's actually Shakespeare. Mike, kingdom. Mike, kingdom. Uh, thou uh, doth uh, uh, a chortle, uh, perhaps. Uh, good riddance to you. Feel free to stick around a while. We love it when you're here. This is Rise Up with Steve, Therese, and Tim on Family Life.